Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about war and peace with Mareed McGuire, who is a member of the advisory board at World Beyond War, and she is based in Northern Ireland. She is a Nobel Peace Prize laureate and the co-founder of Peace People in Northern Ireland uh, in 1976. Um, Mareed McGuire, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you very much indeed, David. I'm very glad to be with you. I'm very glad to see you. It looks like you're doing well. I'm I'm very happy to see. Um, it may be not a happy time in the world for matters of war and peace. War is in the news more than usual. Um, what do you what do you make of the current state of affairs? Well, it is very sad state of affairs, David, to see so much suffering in the world because behind every statistic, there's a broken heart, a broken family, uh, and it's just tragic. Um, and we don't need to have so much suffering in the world, especially uh, human-made suffering, like where we're actually killing each other. We have to learn how to cope with tragedies like the climate change, and but we don't have to go down the road of militarism and war and killing each other when we can talk our problems through and solve them in a civilized way. I think that's a tragedy. They are lives unlived, and especially young children. You know, when you see now what's happening in Gaza, all those little children dying, and you have got to know that there are lives unlived. They'll never live life, and that is very sad. So we each have to do what we can to stop this madness of militarism and, and war in our world today, and we can do it. It's it's encouraging, at least somewhat in certain ways, uh, that there seems to be more activism, more engagement, including from young people, including from people who aren't focused on ending wars uh, most of the time, uh, on ending the war on Gaza. Um, and yet, discouraging that even with that increased activism, uh, we're unable to to move the governments of the world, or at least of the United States and Israel, uh, or the United Nations, uh, which the United States has control over, or the corporate media outlets, which are relentlessly uh, against the people of, of Gaza. What, what do you see in terms of, of what people are doing for peace at the moment, and, and what more can we do? Well, I think that every one of us can uh, see what we can do. And I've been inspired by the huge outcry of people around the world, especially young people saying, this is wrong, this has got to stop. Cease now, we want an immediate ceasefire. And that's tremendous. Now, the fact our governments are not listening to this, we have got to keep challenging them. Um, I mean, what is happening, America's foreign policy is very, very destructive for the whole world. And, and we have got to keep pressing American politicians and leadership. You have got to change your foreign policies. We can't go down this road of militarism because we're just going to destroy the world. The weapons are getting more sophisticated and there is no... Uh, no hold on those who will use these weapons. Um, the fact that now that um, in the United Nations, America vetoed the uh, many, many countries against uh, their wish to stop uh, Israel and its activities against the Pal Palestinian people in Gaza. America actually vetoed the call for a ceasefire. I mean, that is unbelievable. So it's totally that we need to find now, if the United Nations doesn't work obviously with the veto, and it's got to be changed. But in the meantime, we can invoke the Geneva Convention and the, the, the Genocide Convention. 
The Genocide Convention itself was set up for countries who would kill civilians and not uphold their, uh, their international commitments to the Geneva Convention. And what is happening and has been happening since the Nakba in 1940, 1940s against the Palestinian people, Israel is committing genocide. So any country in the United Nations can take Israel to task uh, and uh, stipulate, invoke the Geneva Conventions. Now, I have asked the Irish government to invoke the Genocide Convention against Israel in order to stop this terrible atrocities that are going on. Uh, other countries in the world could invoke the Genocide Convention against Israel. We have uh, South Africa, Colombia, Venezuela. Uh, there's a whole list of countries who could invoke this convention. Uh, and I think we have got to do that because we just cannot have countries ignoring international law like Israel's doing, committing collective punishment against a whole people, genocide, ethnic cleansing. I mean, this has been going on for against the Palestinian people for so long now. We have got to do something to stop it immediately. Mairead McGuire, if a country or a group of countries raises the issue of the Genocide Convention or the Geneva Conventions in the United Nations, is that not subject to a veto by one of the privileged nations like the United States? Is there a body or a court of law that can act uh, out from under that veto threat? Yes, it can work. Uh, the any single country uh, from the United Nations can uh, invoke the genocide convention against Israel and it cannot be vetoed. So I think we have got to use this legal channel to stop what Israel is doing in Gaza. There are a handful of nations in Latin America that have withdrawn their ambassadors and cut off relations with the Israeli government. There are governments around the world who have said they oppose this slaughter in Gaza. Why, why is one of them not willing to pursue this approach? Well, perhaps because not a great deal is known uh, the, uh, about the, the genocide convention. Um, though you, we have some international lawyers who have written about it um, and uh, pointed it out, but sometimes governments feel under threat uh, and they won't take the risk. Um, if, they have, uh, if they have trade with America, with Britain, with France, then they won't take the risk of challenging Israel. But, you know, I think the time has come now we have got to call the Israeli bluff. For too long, Israel has said against anyone who has challenged their human rights, the abuse of human rights against the Palestinian people, they have been afraid to speak out against what Israel is doing. Israel is an apartheid state. Many people know that. Um, it is completely abusing the rights of the Palestinian people. The siege against Gaza is absolutely horrific. If what was happening in any country against its people, that is like the like of which is happening to the Palestinian people today, the world would be up in arms. But somehow we can kind of turn a blind eye because it's Israel doing it. And because Israel will threaten those of anti-Semitism, how often have we seen that? Careers have been destroyed by Israel saying you're anti-Semitic. We've seen that in England. We've seen it in many places. So we have to have courage. We have to say, no, we are not anti-Semitic. We are for human rights, international law. If we don't stand up against what Israel is doing, then who is next? to be treated like this. We have got to take a stand. And America, the American government could tomorrow stop what's happening in Gaza. 
by stopping selling arms to Israel, by stop giving it information, by stop giving it protection. Uh, and we have got to demand that. I have been many times to the Middle East, many times. I've been to Gaza. I went into Gaza on the second boat, the free Gaza boat, and we seen in Gaza the tremendous suffering of the people. They didn't have electricity. They didn't have enough food. They were cut off. One and a half million people, Palestinians, mostly children who were refugees from other parts of the occupied parts of Palestine. And they couldn't even leave Gaza. They're in a big, big, big prison. Uh, and they, they're not even allowed out and they have no hope. And, you know, we had we went in and it was so sad. The place is just being destroyed. Now, this is before the current destruction. But on that occasion, going into Gaza with some politicians from Israel, from the occupied territories, we had meetings with all the different political groups. And we had uh, all the church groups, the faith groups, and they were calling for peace. They wanted dialogue. So we sailed out of Gaza on our little dignity boat, very happy that at least there'd been a bit of a breakthrough and talking, because that's the only way to solve problems, talk. But you know, a week later, Israel carried out with its jet fighters provided by America. They flew over Gaza and they bombed the place. And that was Israel's response to a cry from the heart of the Palestinian people for peace. They bombed the place. And every time Israel has said, we have no partner for peace. I think we have to remind Israel, this has gone on 75 years and it will continue to go on if they continue to say, we have no partners for peace and bombing the Palestinian lands, confiscating the Palestinian lands, because that's what it's about, yeah. and saying they, they can't talk. And the world has got to stand up and say, enough is enough. We have heard enough, and we have witnessed enough, and we know enough to know lies and more lies will not cover up the death of over 10,000 people in Gaza. It's unbelievable. And people uh, must not be afraid to stand up. Yes, some will lose their jobs. Even inside Israel, some of my friends, professors, are being silenced inside Israel by their own government because they have the courage to say, this is not in our name. That's what Israel is doing. And we cannot stand by and allow international law to be trampled into the ground because if we do, who's going to stand up for the people when governments build weapons and threaten the people with them to be silent? We don't want a world like that. That is not a world for any of us to live in. We want a world of human rights and justice and equality where everyone is treasured and we talk and a non-killing world is possible. But a non-killing world will only happen when we have the courage to stand up and say, stop this killing, uphold international law. Absolutely. Uh, we are speaking with Marie McGuire, Nobel Peace Prize laureate uh, from Ireland, from Northern Ireland. Uh, Marie, of course, in this instance, the escalation by Israel uh, uses the excuse not of a cry for peace, but of rockets fired into Israel. Uh, and one of the results that I find a little bit encouraging in a strange way is how many people have been able to bring themselves to say that violence is wrong by both sides, uh, because which isn't equating the violence, isn't blaming the victims, isn't any of this nonsense, but simply to say, it's wrong to murder Israeli children. It's wrong to murder Palestinian children. 
because in most wars, in the war on Iraq, in the war in Afghanistan, in the ongoing war in Ukraine, it's almost unheard of to get anyone to say that both sides are doing wrong, where I believe they are. Uh, is there any lesson that can be Get, that can be drawn from this uh, to increase people's understanding that the pro, that that if the enemy is war, that the enemy isn't Israel, that the enemy isn't Palestine, the enemy is war. The enemy is violence, David, I think. Violence is always wrong. Violence used against uh, a whole people when the violence are used against a few, it's always wrong. And there is always an alternative to violence. And this is what we haven't yet learned. We don't use nonviolence because we've never been taught nonviolence. People say, oh, nonviolence doesn't work. We've never used with such determination nonviolence the way we use militarism and war. I mean, around the world, we now have millions and millions of military young men and increasingly women taught that you must have enemies and you must know how to kill. And it is obscene. Why should we teach our little children in the home to love everybody, to save money and send it to help people who are poor? And then we teach them how to go out and kill people in the most vicious and violent ways. We teach these things. It doesn't, they don't just seal into it. So we have got to teach ways of solving problems through dialogue, through negotiation. Here in Northern Ireland, I think we were blessed because we had a violent war that went on here and it was a war because people were killed constantly. It went on here for over 30 years and we only have one and a half million people. We have a population similar to Gaza. And what we had that day, our war went on and on because nobody had the courage to say, sit down, and talk about it because you can't solve your problem. Now, we in America, some of the American politicians were very good to us, Tip O'Neill, Senator Wilson. Sure, Senator Wilson came over here over a hundred times from America and sat down the conflicting parties here. And he, he sat there and encouraged them, talk, talk, talk. And we, we, we came to a ceasefire, which is the first step. We came to listening to each other because everybody has a point of view and I've got to be listened to. And we came to solutions. Now we have, we have a, a power sharing executive. It's not great. We're not there yet. But you know what, David? Nobody is killing each other here in the streets of Belfast and peace is beautiful. It is absolutely lovely. Peace is great. And we have an example who people who would have said one time, oh, you can't have peace here. So, you know, it's the peace in the Middle East is possible. And it is necessary because Jerusalem, it's a beautiful city. And, uh, you know, Palestine, it should not, it's people should have freedom. They don't deserve to be. Uh, occupied they don't deserve to be treated like animals the way they are treated it's a, it's inhumane but we can have peace if there are courageous people who say we're gonna we've got to solve the middle east because if the middle east is not solved our world will go on fire david it'll spread right across the whole of the middle east it'll and and we'll not stop this and so israel has nuclear weapons uh, and that's a tragedy because there could be somebody who believes in using them. We mustn't underestimate the madness that is out there. There is madness out there. There is, there is evil. There is people who believe in a power and believe in having power and believe in money. And the arms manufacturers, the manufacturers of death, They've made a fortune, a fortune out of these wars. And from every port that exports arms, they are complicit in the death of over 10,000 people in Gaza. 
40% young children buried beneath rubble. Now, it's madness. We've got to stand up and take on our governments, not violently, I'm a pacifist, I don't believe in violence, but we've got to stand up and say, we have problems with the climate change. Climate change is hitting everybody. It's going to get worse. We have problems with poverty. Poverty is everywhere. It's in all our streets. When I went to America, I've been to America over a hundred times because I went there and the American peace movement was so good to me. I'll never forget the goodness of the American peace movement. But I was shocked at seeing people living in tents in San Francisco, in New York, in Washington. I was shocked at the poverty. And I thought, why do they spend all their money on militarism and war? And here's all this poverty of their own people with no jobs, no hope. You know, we need hope. And young people are absolutely crying out for a different way of living beyond war. We can go beyond war. We used to have slavery. We went beyond it. We can have a world without war. It's doable. But we have got to believe in it and we've got to work for it. It won't come on the skies and sailing down from the clouds. We have got to work for peace and non-violence and non-killing and demand this is the way we want to live, not this militarism and war. Do you think, Mairead McGuire, that we are starting to hear a little bit more about the need to negotiate peace in Ukraine, uh, either because people are so excited about a different war or because even the generals are openly admitting that it's a stalemate going nowhere and this nonsense about total victory is, is never going to happen, uh, or for some combination of reasons, are we starting to, to see some acceptance of what people like you and I have been saying from day one, you need to sit down and negotiate peace uh, between Ukraine and Russia. Well, you, you have to negotiate peace with the, the other side. You have to listen to them. You have to respect them. We're all entitled to our point of view. Um, and we have, you've got to find a middle way we had to do that in Northern Ireland, power sharing, listening, very important. But, you know, we have to look also at the institutions that we're building to deal with the problems. They are obsolete. They don't work. God help us. We're landed with a lot of institutions that are not working. I make an example of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. You know, when the Warsaw Pact was dissolved, we should have had the wisdom to dissolve the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and find alternative structures that actually were more inclusive uh, and, and able to work. What we're seeing now is the expansion of NATO across Europe. And when NATO tried to expand right up into the, uh, the borders of Russia, they naturally, they got afraid because they seen all these great uh, armies cooperating together and joining on their borders and they got afraid. Uh, and fear is in all of us. We are, we are very vulnerable. We're people of fear. And once fear sets in, we'll do anything. So when NATO started doing that, uh, then unfortunately the war started, started out. Now, the war is answering nothing. And if generals are honestly honest with you, they'll tell you that they're not going to get anywhere. It's a stalemate. But God help, thousands of Ukrainian young men have died. Thousands of Russian young men have died. Wasted lives. Heartbreak. And how can you ever say that this is a success? Whoever wins war, nobody wins war. But if this keeps on going, there will be war across Europe and the whole world could be pulled into this and we won't stop it. So we have gone to say now, stop the militarism, stop feeding the armies and feeding the killing. 
sit down around a table and solve the problems together because it's the only way. Dialogue, negotiation, non-violently, solving the problem won't be easy, but it'll be easier than dying in the trenches. And it'll be easier for all of us watching our televisions and watching young men in all these countries and women dying, dying in, in trenches and young children dying on the rubble. It is unbelievable. I know the cost of this. My sister um, went out walking one day in Northern Ireland with her little children. And within a few minutes, three of them were all killed. She was dangerously ill and never recovered. She ended up committing suicide because her heart was broken and her children were all dead because of a clash between an IRA gunman and the British Army on a beautiful sunny day on the 10th of August, 76. And she never recovered. And you know, when I look out around the world and I think of all those mothers and fathers who lost their children, they'll never be the same. Never be the same. And it was done by us. We, we made arms, we made guns. We sent guns and helped them go out and it was done. So, you know, David, when the chips are down, each of us has to say in our conscience, am I for the life and a better world for everyone? Or am I part of the military industrial complex? Am I making the guns? Am I building the nuclear weapons? Because we just all can't wash our hands off it and say, nothing to do with me, it's happening on the other side of the world. Our conscience should tell us as human beings, the human person is beautiful, dignified, and that we should stand up for every human person and say to his hair soldier, put the gun down. You don't have to go out and kill someone. Somebody has to say no. Very, very well said. I wish we could uh, go on for hours, but are out of time. We've been speaking with Marie McGuire. She is a Nobel Peace Prize laureate and a leader in speaking out for peace around the world. Marie, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, and good luck to you all, especially the American peace movement. Keep it up. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.